super excited to have everyone here with us today. Um, we have a really special um, presentation. Um, I'm going to just introduce, introduce myself and our program, and then I'm going to turn it over to my students, and they're going to introduce our speakers for today, and uh, we'll go forward like that. Um, so my name is Tessa Hicks-Peterson. I am a professor of cultural studies at Fitzer College and also director of CASA, uh, Critical Action and Social Advocacy, which is a community center in downtown Ontario, which we would all be joyously in together <laughs> with beautiful art in the walls and good food and drink to share. But because of the circumstances, we are doing this all virtually, of course. Um, and we will um, also tell you just a little bit about CASA, the program, which is an academic program that works in partnership with organizations in the um, inland region that are working for social change and community on a variety of different um, topics. And so we've had a speaker series for this entire semester. This is our last one. It's very exciting. Um, and each week we've heard from different community leaders um, and um, organizations that are working on different topics around social justice in the region. And this um, focus today is on art. Art as cultural strategy, as industry, um, art as resistance, art as healing, art as expression, um, art as vocation. And we have two special guests with us who are gonna talk about that further um, that represent two of our core community partners, Arts Area and Malo. So I'm gonna turn it over to the students now and they can um, introduce our panelists. We're gonna do a, a little bit of a different format today um, because one of our panelists has to leave a little early. So we're actually gonna have uh, Malo Asena is gonna go first today and speak uh, for about 15 minutes or so. And then we can have Q and A with her. Um, and then we're gonna invite John to speak and he'll talk about arts area and their work and we'll have Q and A with him afterwards. So that's our format, that's who we are. And uh, let's get this party started. Z and Clayton, you guys wanna do the intros? Yes, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Asana, is, am I saying that correctly? Um, so Asana is a scholar practitioner currently serving as the assistant director of the Asian American Resource Center at Pomona College. Um, they have demonstrated history of working in each higher education sector of California, California Community College, California State University, University of California, and private institutions by way of Pomona College. They are passionate about serving communities of color, both at um, the institution and within nonprofit organizations within the community. They are committed to creating spaces that value indigenous communities and communities of color by way of decolonizing methodologies and pedagogies. They have experience in nonprofit organi organizing, fundraising, student development, career counseling and research. They hold degrees from LA Valley College um, undergraduate degree from Cal State Northridge in communications and a graduate degree from UCLA in education. So without further ado, Asena. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, uh, Clayton. I really appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for being with us this morning and especially thank you Tessa for the um, invitation. I am going to share my screen. Am, am I okay to, to share? So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go through this presentation rather quickly, but I do wanna um, also, uh, you know what, I realized I didn't do the sound, sorry about that. Um, I am going to um, also lean in because I also see uh, a sister of, of mine on the line too, Eleni uh, Sokai is on as well, who is also part of the founding family um, that helped to establish um, Malo. So um, today I am actually standing in also for Lolofi in support of uh, some of the work that um, really has been grounded um, in their family. And so I'm gonna share my presentation with you all. Um, and please feel free, let me know if the sound is not coming through. Um, I would hate to be sitting here on this side, enjoying a whole presentation with no sound. So from your end, so please let me know. Um, but racial and healing justice. Um, and Eleni, I, I know you're on, so feel free to jump in. 
um, we can tag team this morning. Um, racial and healing justice, um, I know is a topic of the day. And so what we wanted to do, at least with um, showcasing what Malo has to offer, has been doing in the local community is just to highlight some of the ways that art has been a part of their work. And so in doing so, um, before we do that, we recognize that we are indigenous people of the Pacific and that we're Tongan, but that we also recognize that we have, um, we are in the Inland Empire, which is also still Gabrielino Tongma land. So we want to begin off uh, first acknowledging, if we're going to talk about things in the Pacific, we acknowledge the indigenous people whose lands we currently now live on. And so in thinking about that, we wanted to also introduce um, where we are um, in the landscape of the Pacific. And so in thinking about the Pacific in general, you have the Polynesian, the Micronesian, and Melanesian. In the middle of this um, large expanse of the yellow, what is considered Polynesia is Tonga. And that is the place that we will be highlighting as far as um, the arts goes. Um, but also know that there's many island nations in the Pacific and that we are, um, we are grateful at least to be um, in an area in the Inland Empire that actually has a really strong um, concentrated number of uh, Tongan um, and Pacific Islands that have been here for years. And so in relation to my work in support of Malo, I have been helping to just develop different parts of the work and specifically um, just holding up some of the funding support that is helping to keep the programs ongoing and so thankfully um, there is a program that actually exists i can share share with you as someone that's also tongan myself there is very few programs that you ever find that are really concentrated and centered on tongan voices and so um, what i can tell you is that malo is a standalone in that respect that i've never really seen programs at all that highlight their ways of knowing their ways of being and so in being able to share with you some of the arts this morning Thank you very much, because uh, it's been an exciting opportunity. And um, I couldn't do that without first talking about the founder, uh, Lolofi Sokai and the Sokai family. Um, here in this picture, you have a picture uh, of the Sokai family and um, Kisina Sokai. This program is really founded um, and, and really guided by this family um, that has been here for over 30 years in the Ontario area. And in um, understanding what Malo stands for, um, and also Eleni, please feel free to jump in. It was founded in 2017, but it actually started way before that, um, in that it was um, pretty much the service that their family had been doing for the community. This is something that we're very familiar with as Tongans. Um, many Pacific Islanders oftentimes came and found a family, found a home, found a church that they would find community with before they were able to really like get their themselves you know on their feet and on you know onto other um uh let's say um jobs and um establishing their own families but um in in establishing malo specifically this program now allows for other families and other children uh, to now be part of it and also to be engaging with the local um, community and providing space for our college students to learn um, about our Tongan community. And so in thinking about that and what the topic is about this morning, racial and healing justice, arts in general, but arts as a cultural expression, arts as empowerment and arts as industry. And so in thinking about that, I wanted just to highlight a few things. There's so many aspects of art that's a part of Malo. Um, I actually had to try to narrow it, narrow it down to a few things. So, um, I have a few videos to share as a part of that um, expression, um, but we'll start off first with the fact that um, Malo is really rooted in the community's children, the youth, the parents, and the elders. Um, we wanted to um, say that up front first because I think if you know anything about our Tongan families, you'll know that it is a really holistic um, picture here when Malo is working with the families. We know that there's children, there's youth, and there's parents and there's elders that are that are part of our community. So rather than just focusing on one, we know that each of them impact one another. And so, as you can see from this picture, this is um, from the top left. You have one of our elders' um, events where the elders were able to come together, and the youth and the children were able to honor them. 
as really our wisdom keepers and those that really like support our program. And then to the right, you see um, Mike Olosakai, who's really been in charge of um, a lot of the cultural performances and our children. Um, Eleni Sakai to the bottom left with our Ikuna, um, our Ikuna goal setting workshop and also our backpack giveaways each year. And then to the bottom right, you'll see that this is our Tongan um, educational showcase each year, which really offers, um, I would say uh, the most, uh, I would say that showcases most of the arts that we have um, as part of uh, Malo. And so in respect to that, um, let's talk about cultural expression. And so in thinking about cultural expression, um, one of the things that I wanted to focus on specifically was the Ma'olu'ulu that they do as a part of the Tongan showcase. And so in thinking about the Ma'olu'ulu, it is a dance that's done with all of the children. It's inclusive of the whole family. And what I wanted to really like look at is as a part of this performance, this art performance, there is a drummer, there is, um, which was Kisina and Fo in the video that I'll show, which uh, Kisina and Fo are also families. Uh, Kisina is um, Lolofi's brother, Lolofi and Eleni's brother. Uh, Fo is also family. The song is written by um, their uncle, Faifikao Wikengalo. And so the dance itself, um, it would, I'd be remiss if I didn't like acknowledge the fact that this type of poetry is not just poetry everybody um, uses. It, there's a selected type of language that's used to write these songs. And so um, in creating a ma'u'u, it is special to have someone write one for you. And so in sharing, um, before I share the video, I wanted to talk about the fact that um, Wike Ngalo was the one that uh, created and wrote the song, but then his daughter, Ane Ngalo, who's also family of uh, Lolofi and Eleni um, Sokai, they were able to actually create the, what we call Pakahaka. They're, so she's the Punaka that actually created the, the dance. And then what they're wearing, they're all wearing um, regalia that's worn by Tongan, but also they're wearing uh, seed that's around their waist that is also handmade. And I want to say all of them were made by uh, by the Yongo Sokai. And so when I change this next uh, slide, um, it will go directly into the Ma'ulu'u. And so you're seeing a form of art expression. In... Speak so softly. Oh, am I coming through? Okay. Um, it, is, uh, it is an expression of art of song, of dance, of language, but also what they're wearing. So give me a second and I'll switch the screen.
that was just a, a clip of the Ma'ulu'ulu. And I, as I shared that there is a expression of, you see song, you see dance, uh, you see regalia, what they're wearing, but also specifically the fact that it was written also by Faifikao Wikingalo and also uh, choreographed by uh, his daughter, um, Anengalo, which is all, um, if you know um, much about Malo, Malo is very much rooted in that it's about the people, it's about the people that are also here, and it's about every aspect of it. So not just the dance itself, but how the children are able to engage with um, one another and engage with um, those who are teaching all throughout the process. Um, now I'll focus on art as empowerment. Um, art as empowerment, um, you know, we thought that it'd be important to include the way that we are now in our, you know, our virtual um, world. And so as a part of, you know, the pre-COVID, you saw our ma'u'u and the way that we have a cultural art expression in that way. Now that we're in a virtual environment, we've been hosting our Malo virtual hours, which is really our time to check in with the community, but also it's also our, our time to just continue to keep, um, you know, culture alive, keep culture as a part of uh, their lives, um, regardless of us being together. And so as a part of that, we host um, our, our hours are inclusive of language in that we have, um, uh, there's a Lord's Prayer that the children read each week, and that's a part of them keeping their language. Um, we also sing as a part of that, but also um, I've been helping to offer Kupesi classes is what we're calling it. If you know what's behind us, uh, if you've been a part of Malo, then you know that these uh, are called Natu in the back, they're tapa cloth that are made by the women in Tonga and then by the, you know, grown by the, the families in Tonga, but made by the women. And so as a part of our work, we've been trying to enjoy the fact that we have other ways to engage with art. And so as a part of that, we've been learning about the specific kinds of patterns that are on these Natu pieces. So for example, um, uh, the knowledge holder for this is Olivia Kaho Mafileo from Kolomotua. She shares that this specific type of symbol that is often on our Ngatus, um, that is often seen, but it is a motif of uh, what, what also is known as like two birds flying, or it could be the variation of night and day. And so before, you know, we'd look at these patterns, but you know, now that we're to working with our children, we're also talking about what what this means and what this looks like, because many of the children are familiar with it, but now we're actually talking specific, specifically about how these patterns um, have meaning to the place that they are from. So two birds, um, manolua, or um, the difference between night and day. And here's a, um, I'll just show just a short snippet of this video, but this video is just actual making of tapa. Not that we make it, but um, because the women make it in the islands, we think it's important for the children to understand how it's made to appreciate um, what their families are now keeping here um, in the diaspora. So a quick second, let me get this up. If there's one sound you hear in Tonga, it's the sound of Tutungatu. Ngatu making in Tonga is the domain of the woman, using age-old traditions handed down from generation to generation. For hundreds of years, Ngatu, or Tapa, has been an iconic symbol of Pacifica, and in Tonga, its significance in everyday life is more prevalent than anywhere else in the Pacific. Ngatu is used in nearly every facet of life in the Kingdom of Tonga. The gift of Ngatu is one of the highest signs of respect. It is used at birth to swaddle a newborn. It lines the bed of a wedding couple on their first night. And finally, wrapped around the body of a loved one in death. 
This is Ngatu Tonga. Sieni Mafuleo has been making ngatu since she was young. Today she's working with a kokoanga group or women's ngatu group at her cousin's village Lepa, the original capital city of Tonga. To make ngato, every woman in Tonga, they work as a group. This is the tutu tree that they use it for the ngato. After this, and then we take off the skin from the tutu tree, and then they're ready to put it in the water, and then get ready for, for the lady to feed it. And the stick, they call it, we call it in Tonga, is a ike. And then the long stick down at the bottom, they call it tutua. We use the skin to making the feta ake. They have two pieces and they combine it and then start beating again. Each woman has a certain length of feta ake they have to make before the next gathering. So now is the time for their kokaanga to show up the every individual uh, with the aki and they, they glue it and then they combine it together and they make one ngato. And so uh, there you'll see that that's, um, that's an example of how these tapa pieces that or the ngato that we talk about with the children in the Malo virtual hours that's how they're made. Um, oftentimes when the children see it, by that time they are being used for weddings, funerals, um, any gatherings, uh, blessings, anything that we know is important and valuable basis uh, for our families uh, to honor and gift one another. These pieces, you'll see them at just about any honorable event. And so um, lastly, art as industry, um, in thinking about this, I um, thought it'd be just great to just showcase a whole uh, uh, collage of some of the things that Malo has been able to do as a part of um, using arts as our way of impacting the local uh, community. And so um, here to the left, you'll see this is some of the work that we were, we've been doing. Uh, we were very fortunate to be funded to do census work. So as a part of our efforts, we know that NHBIs are, are undercounted each census. And so as a part of our work, we were able to include our children, include our families um, as a part of that um, effort. And so we were able to not only count um, our local communities, but also help support um, some of the efforts when it came time to voting. Um, to the right hand side, you'll see this um, picture of us uh, walking in the 4th of July parade with Ontario. And because it's really important for our community, because they've been here for more than 30 years, this is our way of showcasing to the local cities that we've been here and that we have a collective group that's interested in organizing and really making space for ourselves. Um, and then to the top, you'll see um, that's actually, that's Bubba. Bubba wore, is wearing a mask. That's some of the work that we're doing right now because COVID is disproportionately impacting our community. Uh, the NHPI community, for example, in Riverside, we are the number one impacted um, numbers as, as far as cases goes. So we are doing our best in terms of um, what we can do with um, the work that we've been doing, but now the work that we're able to grow into um, into our local Inland Empire area. So um, we do see that this work is a blessing. Um, I think Malo um, is something that Lolofi always says in every presentation is that Malo is the word that is known uh, to Tongans to mean thank you. And so in being able to do this work, we're very blessed, we're very grateful to do this type of work and impact our, not only our children, but also our elders. And um, our hope is that, you know, this work will continue to inspire others to continue to do the same with their own communities. If you don't find, you know, space, create space for yourselves and find um, those that are interested in supporting your work. 
And so thank you for giving us an opportunity this morning to share a little bit about our art. Um, I am closing out with just one last video. Um, and this one, I will show the rest of this one, if that's okay, Tessa. Is that okay to show this one? Okay. The, and this video is the one that was created in support of a census um, by folks specifically on Malo. Some of our kids in the beginning were telling us that um, when people from their when their teachers hear that they're Pacific Islander, they automatically say, oh, you're Hawaiian. Our kids will say, no, we're Tongan. And because they don't know what Tongan is, they just say, oh, yeah, you're, you're Hawaiian. So our kids will walk around saying that they're Hawaiian. But they're Tongan. They speak Tongan. They're raised Tongan. As people ask us, well, is there a lot of Tongans that live in the area? I can't give you a number because we don't have any numbers. My name is Lolofi Soakai. I'm from the city of Ontario. I've lived and served in the city of Ontario all my life. Um, I come from Tongan heritage. We, we love to share culture, so it's very important to us to help to be understood by other cultures. In the Tongan language, malo means thank you. So for us, we're just very grateful people. So uh, we're grateful for experiences. We felt that Malo would be a perfect name to um, do this work under. It's motivating action leadership opportunity. It's becoming this very, very like powerful, powerful, meaningful um, journey for us here in Ontario. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of it with all the families. Malo to me and my family is just um, continuing on with the service that we were taught to be a part of always. I mean, when people came from the islands, we, we wouldn't have much for them, but we, we knew how to make bread last, we knew how to make chicken last. My family knew how to create a setting where everyone felt welcomed, everyone felt um, loved and important. The, the things that we need to work on is making sure that uh, we get people on board and make sure that they're not scared of the census. For them to be scared of the census, it continues to keep us in the shadows. It continues to give us uh, no voice. For a community that has no data, this, this data is necessary, it's needed, and we all uh, need to take part in it. So that's why Malo is taking on this, um, this honor of a, of, a, of a big role in the census for the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities. Uh, we took on this role um, because we already see the importance of it. Because the thing that we can do is to participate in census so that when they say that, I can say there's an actual amount of people, a certain amount of people that live here. If we don't do this work and we don't say anything about it, who's going to do it for us? Who's going to be our voice? We're going to continue to just be where we're at. But if we can actually do the census, um, maybe they're going to, maybe finally these, these numbers, these st statistics will be able to show the, how important it is. It's very important that Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders understand that there's no data, uh, we're under-resourced, and that uh, this is only going to hurt us the more that we don't participate, and that we need to also realize that um, there is, that it's up to us to, uh, to take action and to make sure that we're included, that we're counted. But it's really important that people understand um, that it impacts every single person. If you drive on these streets, it impacts you because this is how we keep our streets paved. If you send your children to school, that's how they're able to provide the um, free and reduced lunch. That's how they're able to provide um, enough teachers, enough schools to be able to serve our children. We also committed to about a thousand pledge cards um, to show that, that we're here. Not only are they pledging that they're gonna be taking part in the census, but they're also pledging to Malo. Malo is gonna go an extra step and call them up and keep them up to date on, on, on dates that are coming up that they need to be aware of. We don't wanna wait another 10 years. Um, we wanna make sure that we take, our, we take action right now. We like to just uh, sh share with the kids like um, that you know good work can happen anywhere, um, no matter where you're, you're at. Like as long as uh, we all have the want and desire for it, no matter where you're at, it can take place. My kids, my kids drive me to do this. I want to make sure that when they grow up, they know that um, that they can do anything they want. They say sky's the limit, but my always, uh, my kids always tell me um, you can go beyond the sky. <laughs> Um, so uh, here's our website. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity, Tessa. Um, 
Uh, I there's so much to to share about Malo, but again, these are just a few a few of the pieces that I was able to at least draw for this morning's meeting. Um, and if anyone has questions, my email's there, um, and also general questions for Malo can go to the Gmail listed. All right, let's give it up. Thank you so much, Sena. This is a beautiful, beautiful presentation, and. Um, Really lovely to see how culture and art come together for social change on so many levels. And we really appreciate um, your time and energy in sharing this. Um, so malo. <laughs> and um, any questions, um, comments? Hi, Sana. This is John. I just wanted to thank you as well for that. Um, and also at JV College, uh, one of my classes covers uh, South Pacific, and it would be lovely to have Malo come and speak when we get to have classes on campus again. I'll, I'll make sure I stay in contact with you, give this presentation to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That sounds sounds like a, a something to, to put on our to-do list. Um, <laughs> let's do it. Awesome. Any questions? comments from the students or any of our invited guests. Hi, this is Eleni. I just wanted to jump in and say thank you to Asena and also the work of, of building Malo into a nonprofit came well before because of the support of Pitzer, Ontario. So we did a lot of work with um, uh, Susan Phillips, also with you, Tessa, and even as um, um, I said, I was explaining all the, the work that we are doing with Malo. Um, a lot of the, the work that we were able to do, especially with racial profiling with uh, Professor Kathy Yep, was um, held in the home that was over at Pitzer, Ontario when you guys were on H Street. Yeah. So we have a lot of history of just working with getting right into our backyard. And we were literally, as far as working with the, the, the men in our um, community about microaggressions. Um, and then we jumped on and teamed on with uh, Proposition 67 um, with ICUC. Um, yeah. So being able to just uh, get in our backyard and letting our community know that, um, and I said, I said it a lot better than I did that I would ever say it, but I always just say we're here and we're not going anywhere. No, And knowing who we are um, has helped because of uh, spaces like Pitzer Ontario, and then being able to grow into my law. But um, I, I just, as far as was able to jump on, I definitely wanted to just say thank you. A piece of a, a, the Ngatu was um, put in a frame and given to Pitzer, Ontario at one point because we brought the Ngatu to the home um, over at 8th Street and we wanted just to continue the work. So whatever we can do to continue the spaces that's being provided by Pitzer, Ontario, and um, also continue our work um, I said, and I have the same color shirt on. I don't know how <laughs> that's awesome, but we do appreciate this. And Chafee College has always been most of most of the, the kids here go to Chafee College or Mount Sac, so they stay very local. Um, a lot of the work that we do is local, so it'll be such a great opportunity to um, be able to go into Chafee College and be able to to share what we're doing right in everyone's backyard. Um, so thank you again, and I just wanted to add those pieces. Oh, thank you so much, Eleni, for saying that. It's really sweet, and I. It is true, like, you know, um, Malo has been a part of um, Pitzer and Pomona and the Claremont College community for, for many, many, many years um, before it even became the proper 501c3, like you were saying. And it was so nice to see in the video uh, that Senna just showed um, Cheyenne, who was a CASA student in this program um, and was really invested and engaged in being an intern with Malo and then just continued on, right? It doesn't end at the end of the semester. Those relationships um, deepen and continue over time. And so, yeah, like you're saying from, from Kathy Yep to Sefa to um, Karen Mack to like, there's just so many people who have engaged in this rich partnership. And I, I think to me, it's really important that um, we have this history that you just brought us of, of how these relationships move over time with local organizations and local colleges and that these colleges are not sort of devoid of knowing that they are in community in partnership with so many different cultural and, and groups and community groups here um, in the IE. So it's, it's really lovely. Thank you, um, Rosalina, for your comment, for everyone else, who, your comments in this. Um, so something you said like really meshes well with trans, um, 
transitioning to John's presentation now because part of what he's talking about is yes, the students in our region at JV College right here in the IE who have so much of their own cultural arts to bring to the fore, like uplifting and supporting them in that. And so that's a, a great, I think, <laughs> um, introduction into the arts area. So I think we'll, we'll transition now into that. If more folks um, have questions or comments, feel free to continue putting them in the chat. But um, Z, if you want to um, introduce John, then we'll, we'll go into that and say one more gratitude again for both of you and your model representation here and to the whole family, um, all the families that come together to do this important work. Yes, thank you both for being here. Thank you, Asena, for presenting. Um, I have my camera off because my Wi-Fi has just been absolutely horrible today. Um, but here's John's bio. Um, in 2016, John Machado founded the nonprofit organization, The Arts Area, and currently serves as the CEO and president of the board. In this position, he also serves on various city and county advisory committees. Um, John Machado has also been a full-time professor of art history at local Chafee College since 2015. I'm sorry, 2005. <laughs> Machado teaches courses in art history covering the complete Western survey, as well as the ancient Americas, Africa, and the islands of the South Pacific. He has recently created an undergraduate program to provide arts business management courses at Chafee College beginning in spring 2020. Machado also has a passion for seeing the world and has traveled extensively throughout the Americas, Europe, and recently Asia. Yeah, so thank you, John, for being with us today and take it away. Okay, so uh, so this is a class that saw my little video at the beginning of the semester. So you're gonna get a kind of a live version of me talking about uh, what the arts area uh, is up to in the region. Uh, so it's staring at me, I'll bring up the slideshow as well. Okay. Can everybody see that? I'm not sure what you're seeing right now. Okay, great. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so the arts area, our focus is on equitable access and equitable representation in, in the arts. And we're talking all the arts, not just the visual arts, all the creative industries. And our specific uh, avenue into that is through economic development. So we are um, supporting the uh, expansion of access to people making a living in the arts. You know, our area in the Inland Empire, we work in San Bernardino, Riverside, and East LA counties is uh, greatly underrepresented in the arts. Uh, the state average for uh, employment in the arts is 12%. In LA County, it's 16%, and in our region, it is under 3%. So we have a lot more people that are interested in uh, making a living in the arts, but they feel they have to leave their area because there's not the support and foundations for economic development uh, in this area. And I witnessed this as a professor, I've been over 15 years now at JP College, and the majority of my students um, are, are BIPOC. We are a majority minority campus and the graduating uh, classes in the arts in our region is close to 80%. Uh, I did a longitudinal study over 10 years of what happens to the graduates from this region after they leave, they end up in careers in the arts. And after you get about 10 years out, it completely flips and 80% of the people making a living in the arts are white. Um, so the students that are doing this work, getting the degrees, have a passion for it, are not feeling that they have the support or the opportunities to continue in that area. Uh, and people that have other access are the ones that are able to continue on in this field. So uh, we, we hear about the idea of the um, brain suck, you know, people leaving a region with all their knowledge. Uh, we have a little bit of a creativity suck in our region. People that have uh, these skills uh, in music and dance and storytelling and the arts um, feel they need to leave our region. And these are our st storytellers, right? These are the people that are uh, our representatives in so many ways, as Mala was just talking about, uh, how they are uh, telling the, the stories and histories of um, their culture through their arts. Um, we do that every day and everything around you is filled with that representation. 
So what we provide is professional development, civic advocacy. We work with uh, cities and counties. Um, I sit on the arts and cultural boards and policy boards for several cities, helping them develop um, ordinances on how to interact with, with artists, um, provide resource support, uh, which can, is also included economic support, and we do fiscal sponsorship, um, as I mentioned, in the three counties that are local to us here. So I'm just gonna give you some of examples of some of the work that we're doing. Um, you don't need to see me anymore. Okay, so uh, most importantly though is uh, not me, but our incredible board uh, that we have that is very much representat representative of the region. Uh, as you can see, our board is 80% BIPOC and 80% women. Um, the majority of them all uh, grew up in this area and they are professionals in this area. So we have uh, the people working on our board. Many of them are artists and musicians, but um, many of them are professionals in business avenues, accountants, um, uh, marketers, uh, uh, startup uh, entrepreneurs that are also interested in the arts and want to give their services, business services to help support artists and organizations expand in the region. Okay. So I'm not going to read through all of this, but uh, at the core of our work, as I mentioned, is to develop uh, the economic viability in an equitable manner uh, for the creative arts community in our region. Um, some of the main things we work on is creating a hub of access for information and for representation, um, the development through these networks and business skills that we provide workshops on, um, again, a lot of this we're having to transition because of uh, COVID and not be able to do things in person. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so providing these economic structures so people can acquire careers uh, in the creative industries without um, needing to leave the region. And we do this by uh, one way is through fiscal sponsorship, which provides opportunities for groups to start with zero money. Not, we're not coming in asking them to invest you about so many, we're here to show them and help them be able to, to take their ideas, make them sustainable so that they're not um, you know, spending all their money from their uh, job that they're using to pay their rent and, and feed their families uh, and be able to expand their ideas at the same time. And all this is done through partnerships. Of course, one of our most important partnerships is when we have at Pitzer College and um, the work being done at CASA. Um, so some of the things that we do through online services as well, uh, we are the host for the Inland Empire Arts Directory. There's about, about 600 artists and organizations on there now, about 10,000 people accessed it during uh, this last year. And it gives you a, a resource list of people from that work in the arts. So if you're looking for an artist or a musician, uh, we hope that people will come uh, to the arts directory first and uh, look for local. Uh, we deal with this a lot with, with organizations and even the cities that are wanting to hire an artist or hire musicians, and they automatically call people in LA. We're like, no, those people are right here in your backyard. Call somebody that lives outside the city hall and bring them over. Um, so understanding that, that access and representation, and this is completely free. We, we uh, sponsor uh, free memberships um, in the directory. Um, this, we don't want income to be any kind of um, wall to keep people from ha having access to representation. Um, we also provide a calendar. Uh, now, again, with COVID, the calendar has been pretty bare lately because uh, this was primarily filled with all of the events that happen weekly throughout our region. Um, a lot of the art walks, the classes that were going on. Um, so this is being transitioned to more online representation as well. Um, and then right now, two areas that we're working on um, more extensively to expand on our website uh, is arts education and a jobs board. Um, so for example, right now, the city of Ontario is hiring a um, graphic and marketing designer right now. A lot of people don't, aren't aware of that. They don't know where to even find this kind of information. So trying to create a jobs board, and we're in the process of creating a jobs board uh, to do that. 
Um, this expansion of the website is being done with the help of the California Arts Council. They um, provided us with a grant to hire a professional design consultant, and Janae Jerrington, who's also an alumni of Chaffee College. And she's gone off to do a great thing. She's worked for Hulu, for Airbnb, um, and we're hoping she can do the same kind of magic for us here in the IE, uh, expanding out our website. A direct way that we've been able to represent social justice and equity and identity is through the exhibitions that are held at Casa Pitzer. Um, the last show that was up for, uh, each show is usually over three months. The last one was up for most of the year because of uh, COVID. And that was the uh, really wonderful. Hopefully you all had a chance to see that, uh, Allison Allen's exhibition of quilts, the protest quilts and slogan journals. Um, that was up from February until just a couple weeks ago. We were able to go in and uh, take that exhibition down. Um, this isn't all the exhibitions we've had there, but there's about these eight exhibitions here. There's 10 different artists and eight of the 10 artists were, were BIPOC artists. Um, so again, uh, representation of the arts that reflects the population of the communities we live in. The educational aspect that we are working with local communities um, is something that we have that is an issue throughout the state. Uh, in the education code, it states that all students are supposed to have access to visual and performing arts, dance, music, theater, and the visual arts. And um, only about a quarter of the schools actually fulfill the requirements of the ed code. And in, in our region, we're a little bit below the state average, but not incredibly below the state average, but, but everybody is well below where they're supposed to be. So one of the projects that we've been working on with the interns from both Pitzer College and Claremont Graduate University uh, is compiling the data that we have from different resources, uh, the broader ones that give us information about how many, kind, how many classes are being taught in the school districts um, and then currently we're looking to bring in extra data. We found another database through the ACLU that gives us the, the more important demographics that we need because we, we know that they provide some classes, but who's taking those classes? Um, are the classes being, uh, are they accessible to the broad aspects of society? Is, is that, are all the students or is it once again, um, are there students with access, students that have come from higher economic backgrounds that are taking these classes or are all students being represented in these classes. So working on that and we're going to be building up uh, information uh, toolkits so that we could go into the communities and they'll have this information on, well, what arts are available in my community and why don't we have more and how do we get the school districts to provide more? Um, many people don't realize you have to be go to the school on a certain day and a certain time uh, if you want to influence how they're going to spend money for the coming year and the classes that they're going to provide. So we're working directly with the community. So this is an ongoing project. And again, this is a joint project with the interns that we're receiving uh, through this program right here. So Z's one of our interns right now. Thank you. Very happy to have her. So a direct way that we can expand um, economic development and uh, more opportunities is through supporting projects. So we expand this, our support for the arts in the region through direct fiscal sponsorship of different projects. And these projects must all engage in equitable representation and equitable access to the arts uh, through various means uh, throughout our region of service. And there's three different kinds of fiscal sponsorship that we are primarily working in. Today, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the first one the comprehensive fiscal sponsorship. Um, these projects complete, completely under our 501c3 tax exempt umbrella. So they are in essence, part of our um, organization. And they're under our insurance. We do all their accounting, their banking, all of this stuff that people would say the boring stuff. We're always like, what, you're gonna do all the boring stuff for us? And we could do all the fun art stuff? Like, exactly. We understand that's the, the part that many creatives um, don't have the, the accounting and the marketing and the grant writing um, expertise. So we're providing that for them so they could focus on their wonderful creative ideas and work with the um, communities directly. So that's comprehensive. Um, we also 
can provide um, for organizations that already have a business license, either for-profit or non-profit, but we see an opportunity for some uh, state or federal funding to bring into their programming. We can uh, run those grants through our um, project. Uh, and then the one that we really are excited about that we're working on right now is the Model F. And this is a little more challenging. It's not offered in a lot of regions. And this is actually providing all the business services to other nonprofits. So we have so many nonprofits in our region, but they're all really small. The majority of them are under 20,000 year budgets. Um, some are even smaller than that. So they can't afford to hire a CPA or a marketing director. But if we pull together um, a dozen, two dozen of these groups, then we can afford to have a full-time person on staff that works for all the different organizations. Everybody has access at all times. If they need to call up a lawyer, they have somebody to call that's on staff um, or at least on retainer. Um, so that's what we're working right now to be able to provide these kind of services um, beyond our sponsored programs, but also to other organizations. Um, so a little bit about, uh, that's weird. Okay, so a little bit about some of our organizations, our uh, comprehensive organizations. Uh, some of them you might have heard of, uh, been around for a few years. Uh, so the arts area was established in the summer of 2016. And then for the last two years, we've been doing bringing in different groups for fiscal sponsorship. Um, our first organization that came on board is a publishing company called Curious Publishing. And they do uh, several things. They have two different uh, magazines. They have a quarterly magazine. That's their uh, title brand, uh, Curious. And on the screen, you're seeing a few of the issues from this last year. Um, on the left was the uh, a woman's issue it was actually their largest issue. There's 75 artists in there, over 250 pages. And again, the majority of these artists are all from the Inland Empire. You'll find some from LA. Um, actually, they've grown a lot. They're getting submissions from international artists, trying to keep that to a limit because it's really focusing on our uh, local artists. Um, the image in the middle is from the spring uh, Latinx issue. Uh, we did a launch. This was right before COVID shut everything down. Actually, the week before was our last big events. We did a ser series of events with the Riverside Art Museum. Uh, we had the, the launch party for the magazine, um, coordinated a lecture panel uh, discussion on the history of uh, Chicano art. Um, if you're not aware, the first Chicano art museum in the world is actually going to be opening up in Riverside next year um, with the starting collection of um, Chich Marin. Um, so we were, are doing some educational programming with them as well. And then also some uh, had, a, had a workshop on uh, publishing, uh, independent publishing as well. And the issue on the right is uh, was the uh, queer issue, um, focusing on artists, uh, LGBTQ artists. And the and next issue coming up is being curated by um, Mariah Green, and she is a black artist out of Riverside and the, the BIPOC issue that will be coming out hopefully in December. Uh, right now they're still um, collecting submissions and uh, raising funds for the printing of that next issue. Um, they also do a biannual magazine called A Beam that focuses on broader issues of uh, culture and fashion. Their most recent issue that just came out uh, last week um, uh, called O Pioneer is focusing on um, a lot of the Black Lives Matter uh, events that happened this year and uh, a variety of other uh, social justice issues um, happening that are very important, uh, not only to our region, but to the country and the world. Um, they also publish individual artist books. Uh, they've done about a dozen. And, and again, about 90% of those are focusing on uh, artists of color. Our second project we brought on is an art gallery. So a physical space in Redlands called the Artlands. And uh, they keep a rotating uh, schedule of artists between 12 and 15 different artists always on uh, physical display. Of course, this was shut down for about six months. Now we are open again, um, limited number of people in at a time. Uh, the website also uh, represents artists. They also do other work within the community. Um, they do some small publications as well. I just did one that launched on Halloween. Um, some of you might know uh, 
uh, Duan Kellum. He is the director of School Boys, a uh, print shop organization. They just opened up a space in San Bernardino called um, Creative Grounds. And uh, they just had a soft opening with that last week. Uh, they also uh, sponsored a new mural in Redlands uh, with Parliament Chocolate, uh, focusing on uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, we also are the uh, sponsors for Pripyat Art Book Fair, which has not happened yet. Uh, it was supposed to open the weekend that the world shut down. We had everything installed, ready to go for an exhibition. Um, I should also point out that our project directors for these projects I've been um, mentioning for Curious um, is a, a, a Latina a woman. Um, Julian that runs the Print Art Book Fair um, is a black photographer. And so right now we're working on, uh, we're, we're waiting for things to live so we could have a large event. This was actually supposed to be at the Fairplex, a three day event spent a year planning it and then three days before the event was opening it got shut down and we don't know when the fairplex is going to be opening so we're actually looking for potentially uh, other um, locations um, got some fillers out for maybe claremont colleges so i'll talk to tessa about that <laughs> uh, and then our most recent uh, project that was brought on is the young artist initiative and the director of this project um, is, is young. She's a, actually a freshman. Uh, she's from the uh, Inland Empire from Ontario, and she's in her first year of college at Irvine College. And she is um, a, um, a ballet dancer and, and is a woman of color, a, a black a creative. And she has, her experience, her personal experience of being the only woman of color in all of her classes and um, not being able to have that reflection of seeing people like her in the arts and the reason that she lives, she was very interested in creating a mentorship program. So for other um, young BIPOC um, creatives that are interested in being in the arts, of them not being discouraged. So what I was talking about when we looked at even for uh, college graduate students, that the majority of them end up not staying in their field of choice for a variety of reasons. And one of them is feeling that they have no network, they have no structure, they have no support. Um, so the Young Artists Initiative will be um, going into uh, schools. Of course, right now it's gonna be online, um, providing mentorship. Um, they also are um, create projects. They're actually publishing a poetry zine right now. They're working on a, um, with a um, Indian artist right now, not, not a Native American, actually from India, um, artist, uh, a singer, um, producing a video um, right now for, um, for this musician. So they want to also be an avenue for providing uh, um, visual representation and expanding their networks as well. So just to give you some ideas of the uh, projects that you know, we, we do support and the kind of projects that we will continue to bring on uh, under our uh, fiscal sponsorship umbrella. John, we don't have much time, but I wanna make sure- we That was it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off, but I there's a great question in the chat. And um, I think maybe we can just try to at least answer just this one before we have to head off. Sure. Let me see what the chat I'll, And I'll read it to you. Where do you envision the creative economy going in the post-COVID world? Where do you think art goes at a time when we are redefining public health and safety after this summer, perhaps as an interdisciplinary practice of healing and strength during grassroots community organizing or uplifting voices in spaces? What do you think art at this time? Yeah, well, the thing that was interesting is the, the direct impact uh, wasn't, I mean, it was huge as far as events, as far as the theater just got decimated. I mean, you can't have uh, theater events. Um, music uh, was hit as, as well, not as hard as live performance. Um, and then uh, the arts having open exhibitions, but the transition to the online venue and the continued support that the community has given um, because it's needed, uh, people, want the arts in their lives. You know, whenever I hear somebody, uh, you know, 
that doesn't understand that, and we think about during COVID, who did everybody turn to? Who has gotten people's sanity through COVID? If you didn't have access to books and to movies and to music, um, the, the, the impact it's had on people's mental health uh, during COVID and being quarantined. I mean, I didn't leave this room for six months. Actually, I just got back from a three week trip. I finally rented an RV so I could be in a little social distancing bubble and I drove across 21 countries this, in the last month. Um, because I, I, I needed to, to see things. I needed to be able to um, go beyond my own home. Um, so any way that the arts can be accessed, we're seeing that uh, people have gravitated to wherever it is to find it. So the online uh, access to the arts, the online continuation of, of workshops and providing, um, as you uh, worded it for, for healing, um, a lot of artists have been doing incredible work or providing classes uh, through um, a variety of different uh, technologies online. So after COVID, uh, I, I see that artists continue to play the role that it's always played um, as long as humanity has been around. You know, I, I'm, my, my primary job is history, right? I teach art history. And the, the arts of all forms have been the center of identity, the center of education, uh, the center of telling our stories and, and the center of progress. So um, it, it's hard to answer that question without just saying, well, obviously the arts are going to be there as an important aspect in um, all aspects of healing of our community and the growth of our communities. It, it just reminds me of, I don't know if you saw a week and a half ago, the LA Times um, Saturday calendar section, the entire thing was devoted. It, the it was a huge spread that said, can the arts heal our cultural divide in this nation? And every page of the calendar section that day talked, you know, the theater arts, dancing, music, visual, art, all these different arts, what can, what are they doing? What can they do for us at this time? And it's like, that, that might be our saving grace as it has oftentimes in, in, in our country in times of peril that we turn to the arts for connection, expression, um, all kinds of things. So we need it now more than ever. Yes, yes. Um, so we have come to the end of our time. I'd like to give you a huge thanks, John, for sharing with us the important work of your organization to lift up uh, the great art that's here and uh, we're really glad that you get to, we get to partner with you through CASA. Um, and for those of you who don't know, CASA Space has a rotating art exhibit, as John mentioned in his presentation. And, and so um, when, when we're allowed to come back in person, we hope you'll come and see whatever um, great thing we have at that point, whatever that is. <laughs> oh, I, I should have pointed out, we are also right now are, um, for those artists that we have scheduled for exhibitions, we're actually doing going to be launching um, studio visits we've done with them now, virtually interviews. So you'll, you'll, you'll be able to experience those artists that were supposed to be in CASA mm -hmm. online soon. We've been working on that. Oh, that's great. What a wonderful way to do it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, John, and wish you the best in the rest of your day back, in, your, back in the same room <laughs> after your long 21 state tour. And to everyone else, thanks for joining us. And to my students, we will regroup in about five minutes or so. Cool.